Good morning brothers and sisters on this Sabbath day and welcome to Happy Sabbath. I'm afraid we haven't got Kyle with us today, he's in the hospital and uh, we're praying for him and hope that he'll be okay and back with us soon. So it's Sacrament Saturday on this Sabbath day and let us invite the Spirit to be with us. Loving Creator God, we thank you for your love and that you want to be with us and you care about us all. And I pray that your spirit be with us today and also be with our brother Kyle in the hospital that they'll be able to sort his problems out and uh, he will be better. Lord, we ask for your spirit to be with us and I say these things in your gift to us, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. So hopefully you've got your um, emblems and and wine ready for the for the sacrament. And uh, today I'm going to say the prayer from Community of Christ, and this is the contemporary language, the combined prayer. At this time, we welcome all present to Christ's table. We invite all who would participate to do so as an expression of the peace and love of Jesus Christ, in whose name we worship. The Lord's Supper is a sacrament, a time to focus on the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As disciples of Christ, we renew our covenants and recommit together to His mission, to grow closer to Jesus Christ, as individuals and as a community, worshipping Jesus Christ through God's Word, the sacraments, ministry, outreach, Kabbalah, and Jubilee. We encourage all that are worthy to receive communion to do so frequently and devoutly. So if you bow or kneel, whichever you prefer, And we will get ready to bless the sacrament. Eternal God, we ask you in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this bread and wine to the souls of all those who receive them, that they may eat and drink in remembrance of the body of the blood of your Son, and witness to you, O God, that they are willing to take upon them the name of your Son and always remember him and keep the commandments which he has given them, that they may always have the, his Spirit to be with them. Amen. As we take our time, to take the sacrament we remember the things that Jesus did for us. Uh, he died for us. And we're thankful. We can't imagine the pain he went through, Lord, but we thank him for that. And we know that through him we can get to know you. Shalom, brothers and sisters. Welcome to this week's Sabbath service. We're going to start off with the scripture. This is Romans 11:6. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. I like that scripture because it is just as confusing and easy to understand as the battle that we as Christians fight over works and grace. I remember as a youth, I was trying to study other churches outside the Latter-day Saint movement, 
because of where I grew up and, and the things I had access to, I saw this idea that Catholics were all about works, Protestants were all about grace. And I had this idea in my head that as Latter-day Saints, we, we met in the middle. We knew we needed both the works and the grace. But at the time, I didn't really get what the works were. I thought the works were baptism, getting the priesthood if you're a man, going to the temple, filling callings, things like that. And, and the grace was that personal growth that we do in Jesus Christ. And, and I still maintain that the second one is, is at least on the right track, if not correct. But now I've come to see it a lot differently. We know that baptism in and of itself doesn't have any saving power, right? It's just an outward ordinance that represents an inward commitment. Does it need to be done? I don't know. I'm, I'm going to say that, I'm going to say this. If you are moved by the Holy Spirit to be baptized, get baptized. And I don't think that anyone's not going to be moved to be baptized. There may be exceptions to that. So I guess maybe I shouldn't say not everyone. But at the end of the day, I do know that being baptized, being dunked in water without being born again, take a shower, take a bath. It, it, it's, it's irrelevant. It doesn't, it doesn't work. It doesn't matter. Now, there are those that will say, well, then you're fine because you've been dunked in water. So later on, later on when you actually are born again, you don't need to be rebaptized because you've already been dunked in the water. But I've met people that belong to churches that don't do second baptisms. And once they've really actually for real come to Christ, they want that. They, they crave it desperately. And, and they, they can't get it in the church that they belong to. And I think that's a shame. I think that we should be able to be baptized anytime the Spirit calls us to do so. But I don't think that getting dunked in the water is really the work that God is looking for to show the world our grace. So what is it then? Well, before I get into that, I want to share with you the parable of the pencil because I think the parable of the pencil is, is a really common um, Latter-day Saint understanding, and, and I would say it's a pretty generic Christian understanding as well about, about sin and atonement. And the idea is that with grace and works, it's like a pencil. And with the one side, you write, and you flip it over the other side to erase. And so the grace of Jesus Christ, as we go out and do works, and we, we do good things, we do bad things, we don't want to just cross things out with, with the, the lead, the atonement of Jesus Christ allows us to use the eraser to make it so that part just isn't there at all. And there are people that will say, but, but, it, but it is there. If you do something horrible, okay, let's, let's, let's do something innocent. Let's say you break a window. That, that window is still broken. The atonement of Jesus Christ can give you the grace after breaking the window to fix the window. No. But to atone for your, the sin of breaking the window, right? Jesus doesn't come down and put his hands on the window and, and heal the window. If it rains and the, the floor gets wet, it doesn't heal the floorboard. And so because of that, there are some Christians who believe in this idea of restitution. But then, is that, is that grace? So I, I want to flip the script a little bit. And I want to talk about works and grace in a different way. There are some people who have this idea that if you, okay, my window's broken. And yeah, you can work all summer saving up to fix it. But you didn't really fix the hurt, the fear. I was worried people would come in through the broken window and steal my things. Maybe someone did come in through the broken window and steal things. Maybe the floor got ruined because of weather. Because the person didn't have the money to fix the window and had to wait. Didn't have any plastic to put up or didn't get up in time. And so there's other problems and complications. You can keep working so hard and keep fighting it. But like student debt in the United States, you can't even pay the interest on it. And so eventually it gets to a point to where you owe so much more than the debt originally even was. 
And then the question becomes, well, where is the grace? So instead of looking at this this week from that perspective of I messed up and the Lord is allowing me an opportunity to repent in spite of what the world is going to do to use this terrible thing against me. I want to flip it around. And I want to say, what if grace and works comes from the other side? Because the fact that the person who had their window broken is a Christian, because they are born again, they say, I forgive you. You don't have to make restitution at least not any more restitution than what you are capable of. So if this person that broke the window is too impoverished, they say, you know what? I can't fix the window either, but I forgive you. And I still love you. And I still accept you. If they can and they're willing to pay, for a certain portion. I can pay this much, but it's all that I have. Or that's all the way to pay, period, and they don't have any more. Either way, you have the grace of Jesus Christ to accept what they are able to do. Or what if they gaslight you? What if they're rich and they get a lawyer and say, I'm suing you for your window cutting my ball? You forgive them. You do what you have to do to move forward in Christ. And there's a fine line here because it doesn't mean that grace says we have to let people walk on us. Jesus told us to turn the other cheek. He told us to go further than whatever it is someone asks, to go the extra mile, right? Every situation is going to be different. And I think that's what grace really is. How do we have the peace in our hearts to move forward with our lives in spite of the fact that in this world, people demand justice and they don't demand it through equality. They don't want equal justice. They want to, how can I get ahead by taking more from you than what I am owed. I think true grace is if Jesus is meeting us where we are and giving us his atonement, then I think that the true grace and works that the Lord is looking for is for us to do the same. Imagine, imagine if Jesus said, I suffered in this world. I wandered around teaching the gospel. I had nothing. And then I went to the Garden of Gethsemane after my last supper, and I sweat as it were blood from every pore. And I hung upon the cross. And then I came back, and I rose myself from the dead, If you want my atonement, I expect you to do the very same thing. It reminds me of King Benjamin's address, where King Benjamin said the exact opposite. You were just now begging God for forgiveness of your sins, and he forgave you freely. Who are you? How dare you? Tell the beggar, you deserve to be poor. I don't believe that Jesus asks us to go through what he went through. But I do believe that grace and works is really about us meeting others where they are to the best of our ability, just as Jesus meets us where we are. I want to be clear. I'm going to say it again. That doesn't mean we let people gaslight us or take advantage of us. Because if that's where they are, 
That's where you have to meet them. How can you still love them and accept them? I love the story of Joseph Smith and W.W. Phelps. During the war, Mormons versus Missouri, Phelps was one of the men that bore witness against Joseph Smith. Now imagine that. Joseph Smith spent time in Liberty Jail, and it was not a pleasant experience. And he was there, in part, because of the testimony of a friend. And yet later, while Phelps was, he was actually living in Dayton, Ohio, where, where I am now, he wrote a letter to Joseph Smith asking for forgiveness, asking to return to the fold. Joseph could have said no. In, in, in the world's view, he had every right to, but he didn't. He forgave him. He welcomed him home. I don't know that I am where Jesus is. But I hope and pray that I am where Joseph is that day when he let W.W. Phelps back in, in full fellowship. That, to me, is a true expression of works and grace. So, my message for you today is this. Don't just make it about what's going on in here. Make it about taking what the Lord has placed in our hearts and allowing it to flow out into the creation to heal the world. Don't just be a receptacle of the grace. Be a lighthouse of that grace so that others can see Christ in us and come unto Christ. That is my message this Sabbath, and I leave it with you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. So we pray, especially at this time, for those people that are sick. And uh, we had our prayer meeting the other day, and Mark was on there as well, and we pray for him. Continual praying for Mark and all the other people that are in our prayer book, which we pray on on a Thursday night. It's seven thirty in the United Kingdom. Uh, I guess it's in the afternoon in America. And uh, if you'd like to know more about the fellowship. Uh, why not have a look at the website with the address that will be above or below. The closing prayer now, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, this Sabbath day, and we ask that you, your spirit will be with us and help us sort things out in our life, Lord, and uh, help us to get to know you more. We pray for all those that are sick. We pray for peace in our world. And I say these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Goodbye. Shalom, brothers and sisters.